So, first, Christine, for giving me the opportunity to speak. One thing is that it's a, it's a presentation on near spec with a little bit of, little bit of uh, GeneVST in the middle. Uh, of course, like uh, for all these tough presentations, it's not my work only that I'm presenting. So the acknowledgments at the beginning, just to really stress that uh, this session is made of bits and pieces from uh, the work of a lot of people uh, in the team, but also JWST and uh, the other instrument teams and uh, STSCI. So, I hope you can see the slides uh, changing. Yes. So before I start with your spec, I could not resi resist, uh, especially if you had the talk one month ago uh, on NIRCAM. Uh, maybe Marcia showed so some uh, images of JWST, but uh, in one month many things happened. And uh, so yesterday morning, basically, I took uh, some webcams uh, showing the view of the um, big room at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And what I did, I took a screenshot of the webcam because it's quite impressive. I'm biased because, yeah, I, I really like this project. But uh, you can see, in fact, the uh, C uh, integrated. Uh, so on the on the right, with all the primary segments, uh, all the um, the three and the tertiary, so the telescope itself, yours, and uh, on the right side, in fact, the little uh, the structure, the black structure. And I've put an earlier uh, picture from 2015 to show also the scale of the payload module, IZIM, with four instruments. And you have the electronic, uh, electronic boxes in the back. And it shows you that it's really uh, interesting. And these are very interesting times because uh, we see things coming together. So that was a little uh, two minutes of uh, pure JST. So I'm going to move to near spec. And, um, so here we're going to go through dark steps. We talk a little bit about the origin of near spec, why near spec, uh, team, and the hardware. Then I will move to the instrument itself to give some generic uh, information about the instrument, the configurations, the modes. And then I focus on uh, the three modes of near spec, so multi-object spectroscopy, integral field spectroscopy, and then the, what we call the fixed slits. And in fact, in particular, one uh, one of these slits is in aperture, which is used for, which is planned to be used for exoplanet transit spectroscopy. And I will move to a co conclusion. So we go, look back at the origin of uh, near spec. Uh, so we have to look back at the science goals of JWST, and um, they are fairly broad. They cover indeed uh, what we what was called at the time origins. So it goes from uh, the reionization epoch, the assembly of galaxies, you have the formation of planetary systems uh, and formation, formation stars. And, uh, yeah. of I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. You're breaking up a little bit. So if you could speak closer to the phone, I think that would be really helpful. OK, I would try, I would try like that. Is it better? Yes. So, yeah, what? Well, it should be better like that. So, and then another topic that basically appeared during the, between the time JWST was imagined and the time it became a reality or a planet. And uh, what I have put just low is uh, these are a few examples for one very recent with uh, the equal uh, 11 uh, galaxy uh, detected recently. And over part, which one is a 3D spectroscopy of a young stellar object, and then uh, some modeling uh, for the near infrared and mid infrared spectrum of uh, of an exoplanet. And for me, the message is uh, from this, all these science cases is that when you look at the science case of JWST, you see that spectroscopy will be a key tool uh, to achieve these goals, and it it will be a key tool for astronomers uh, using uh, JWST. And uh, that was obvious at the beginning, of course, and uh, in particular, when uh, for near spec, we, if we, the topic near infrared spectros spectroscopy, in fact, what uh, what was found at the beginning is that what was needed 
was being capable of multi-object spectroscopy and deep multi-object spectroscopy over a fairly wide field of view. There was a need for capability to look at a single object spectroscopy and to really look at a, a specially resolved object, single objects, and uh, typically with a small field of view. And then also what we call high contrast spectroscopy, the clean spectroscopy at various spectral resolutions. And these, these kind of uh, initial requirements basically shaped what, what became near spec. And uh, so this triggered the need for near infrared spectrograph. And in this case, this near infrared spectrograph was uh, provided by, uh, by the Europeans, and uh, in particular here, uh, the European Space Agency. And it became basically part of the European contribution to the JWST mission. And uh, what you see here is kind of schematic of uh, a mission with the different segments and contributions of the different um, and JWST is a correlation between NASA, ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency. For NIRSPEC, and, uh, on which I'm focusing, it was provided by ESA and uh, built by an industrial consortium, in fact, uh, mainly uh, European industry. And if you look at the team, uh, basically, you, you will find uh, industrial companies all around Europe, a few, a few science institutes, and also uh, in NIRSPEC, you, you have also uh, NASA provided uh, contribution, uh, provided elements, the detectors and the crochet arrays, and the micro arrays. I will present them a little bit more when we discuss about the multi-object uh, spectroscopy. So itself, and it's still not real hardware, these are schematics, basically. Uh, the instrument, uh, in spec is fairly big. It's uh, two meter by 1.3 meter and uh, 70 centimeter, a little bit more than 200 kilograms. And it's, made by, it's very classical uh, design where you will find uh, optics region where the sky is reimaged on all our apertures. What I call apertures will be the slits, the mic shutters, the entrance of the integral field unit, and back here have the spectrograph uh, and the detectors. Real wear uh, looks like that, and that's actually the near spec before we put on the cover because there is a, a LI uh, cover that, uh, that is uh, light, light tight, which is put on this kind of uh, uh, golden pillars all around the all around near spec, and this is really the uh, the hardware before we delivered it uh, to NASA in 2013. And uh, the next picture is in fact uh, from last year, and it be, uh, before the final test campaigns uh, of the payload module, and this is the payload of JWST is called IZIM, and uh, it contains the four instruments. And uh, with the red arrow, you have uh, near spec. Uh, in the middle, uh, um, old instrument, it's NIRCAM, which, which has two modules, and those who have seen the talk from Marcia last week uh, are probably familiar with this uh, geometry. On the right, you see also covered with uh, uh, silver uh, type M MLI. In fact, uh, there is MIRI, the MIDI infrared instrument, and the other and the nearest instrument are hidden uh, behind NIRCAM. So this for us, that was another big milestone when all, all these instruments, and including the spec, were, were integrated there. This was the hardware, and I don't go too deep on the hardware. So I'm back to the, to the uh, state, which is uh, what do we need to achieve uh, science goals? And I'm going to go through the instruments and its capabilities, and all the, they are reflected, these needs, which are listed here, are reflected in the instrument. So three needs, and in fact three modes, three main modes in, uh, in the instrument. The first is indeed multi-object spectroscopy, and typically with 200 mark second wide uh, mini slits. Uh, what we call wide field of view, it's, uh, it's smaller uh, compared, to, it's fairly small compared to what uh, you can find now on ground-based uh, uh, facility in terms of multi-object spectroscopy, but it's, it's a decent uh, field of view. Nine to a half minutes, and it's spectroscopy at low, uh, at medium spectral resolution, and medium for us is uh, around 1,000. And French, and that's one uh, thing for NIRSPEC, is fairly large, from 0.6 to 5 micron, or on the medium resolution 0.7. Then the second mode, in this case, we move to really taking at individual objects. So we have a few integral field unit 3D spectroscopy. 
with a thing of uh, 0.1 arc seconds, 100 milli arc seconds. And uh, so we slice the field of view, we spread the, the little slices in order to be able to disperse the light. And uh, in total, the number of pixels, and uh, in this case we call them SPAC cells, it's of 30 slices of 30 pixels, so we have 900 SPAC cells. We have 900 spectra, uh, each covering 0.1 by 0.1 arc second on the sky. So the field view is not that big, three arc second by three arc second, but it has a very good uh, sampling and a very good spectral uh, spatial resolution. So there. And in this case, we can also use uh, routinely a mode which is at higher spectral resolution, 2700 typically, instead of uh, the low and medium ones. And um, the high spectral resolution mode could also be used with a MOS, but at the cost of uh, not being able to use part of the field of view because the spectra would be truncated. So we usually do not uh, advertise it as uh, available for MOS. One key thing for your spec, and I will come back on that, that later, is that the IFU and the MOS, they cannot be used at the same time because they, they compete for our detectorial estates. So you have to choose which mode you, you use. And the third mode of uh, near spec, so this is the high contrast uh, slit spectroscopy, and uh, including this aperture, which is used for extrasonar planet uh, transit observations. And we have five slits. Uh, um, and uh, with, which can be used with all spectral resolution modes. And one interest here is that these are always available. In fact, they have their own uh, detector, allocated detector real estate. They are all fade safe. If something goes wrong with the instrument, uh, these, these uh, seats are always available. So, jump JWST because even if I'm, uh, I'm presenting a spec, I think it, it's it's something very important that uh, you have to be aware that JST will offer you a lot of uh, different uh, spectroscopic capabilities. So I'm a big fan of near spec, but of course you have different type of spectroscopy, different type of spectral resolution. So at the end of the day, uh, if you plan with JWST, you will have to take a look and pick the mode with the best, uh, the best for, for your science objectives. Here you can see that NIRIS, NIRCAM have less capabilities. Uh, so when you near spec with the most IFQ, the MIFRA instrument is also offering a IFU. We have slit. Uh, MIRI has also a slit uh, spectroscopy. We have Arthur, like uh, also NIRIS. And in fact, MIRI has also some uh, slit spectroscopic capabilities uh, over its major field of view. So quite a lot of, uh, quite a bit, I think, here. So in the rest of the talk, I will talk only about the near-spec ones, but I think it's important to, to have a broader view of what JWS to offer for you. In terms of uh, spectral configurations, so as I said, we go from uh, 0.6 microns, so on the visible or the end of the visible, and uh, 5.2 to 5.3 microns. Uh, so we have one configuration at low spectral resolution, and when I say low, it's fairly, it's quite low from thir between 30 and 300, varying quite a lot across the, um, the spectral range. But the interest is that you get full coverage of uh, this uh, 0.6 to 5.3 micron range in one shot. And then you can, if you go at medium or high spectral resolution, and in this case, it's technically because you go from a prism for the two gratings, there you're limited to octaves. So in order to cover the full wave of range, you need to use different gratings. So you will need uh, several exposures to cover that. And in fact, if you want to go from one micron to 5.2, you will need three exposures. And you see the, the configuration on the top of the screen. You can probably maybe see my, uh, the mouse uh, there. So I'm talking about the brown uh, configuration. And we have basically combinations of filters and gratings in order to achieve that. Or uh, we are not alone doing spectroscopy in, uh, in uh, near spec. So here, what I did, I plotted as a function of wavelength the spectral resolution offered for different modes available in uh, JWST. So you very clearly beyond five micron, you have we have uh, the uh, real of MIRI. So you have MIRI IFU and also the MIRI single object spectroscopy. 
when you go in the infrared, you have more, uh, you have uh, choices between three instruments. So the green curve at the bottom is really our low spectral res resolution configuration with its quite extensive coverage of, uh, of the near infrared part. Then you go up and you have uh, um, the uh, purple um, curve, so our high uh, call 1000 uh, configuration. And at the top here, you have our, what we call our high spectral resolution configuration, so three bands. So that's kind of uh, giving you also a picture of, uh, in terms of parameters, as base wavelength uh, spectral resolution, uh, what JST and MIRSPEC can offer you. In terms of web French and this type of things, uh, people who, who are working uh, on Galaxy Assembly are familiar with this type of uh, plotting. Uh, what kind of classical uh, online diagnostics are available uh, in the wavelength range of near spec as a function of redshift? And what you see is that basically up to redshift uh, on the order of seven, you have the usual classical diagnostics which are um, available directly but keep some very interesting lines up to the high rate shift, and then you get the UV lines popping in uh, near spec uh, wavelength range also. So it's quite interesting for Galaxy Assembly, and that's not surprising because that's what, one of the big drivers at the beginning. But it's new for galaxies, and uh, here I took an example uh, from a presentation. Uh, there was a conference on uh, exploring the universe with JWST last year in uh, October where before people came and gave presentation of uh, potential programs, what could be done with WST. So I, I, I extracted from one presentation from uh, Catherine Veste de Oliveira something uh, using a wide dwarf uh, spectrum, and you have two different models, uh, Morley and Tremblant, and uh, you, can, uh, you can see that uh, this is a, a small simulation uh, with um, fake noise added on the spectrum, and you can see that you can easily uh, distinguish between uh, different models, and you can see the signature uh, identified some uh, some the position of molecular bound signatures. So it's quite uh, this domain is very interesting uh, for that also. So think to the instrument, but now moving a little bit more to to the field of view and all the what data uh, looks like. This is. A sketch of the field of view of JWST, so the complete uh, uh, telescope. Uh, you see the, the, the rough the location of the field of view of the different instruments. So you see near uh, right, near east, then two modules of near cam. You have the two guiders there. And there on the left side, in black, you have in fact the, the, four, the field of view of near spec. Which, which, in fact, this is the field of view for the multi-object spectroscopy, which is divided in four quadrants, so Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And it's because we are using uh, arrays of micro shutters for target selection, and we have four of them. And uh, each of these uh, portion of our field of view corresponds to one quadrant. So now, focusing on near spec, you find, again, this quadrant. The, in the, the black region, black uh, rectangles um, in the right sketch. And what I'm going to explain in this diagram is uh, what the data looks like on the detector, because of course you're going to open uh, some micro shutter to get uh, light from objects uh, entering, and then you're going to disperse and get the spectra. And we have detectors, and uh, so and what you see with uh, rectangles is the extent of, uh, of the MOS spectra, so the spectra coming from uh, for the multi-object spectroscopy. So these two red boxes coming from the, the quadrants. And then you have always available, as I said before, the slits. And those have their, have their own real, real estate, and uh, the, it's, it's, a, sim, it's a simplified way. This is the, this rectangle with the, the slit spectra. And the zoom on the left side shows, in fact, uh, drawings of the slits, and you can see the rectangle, the square, sorry. This little square here is the A1600 aperture, what we call 1600 because it's uh, 1.6 arc second by 1.6 arc second, which is used for exoplanet uh, transit spectroscopy. This one, just ignore it for now, it's on the next slide, it's going to be the A2. Here we basically, the two detectors are located 
printed were these, uh, these red and yellow boxes. So this is mostly split, but as I said before, when we move to IFU, to integral field uh, spectroscopy, there you, we use the same uh, real estate. So what is going to happen is that when we use integral field spectroscopy, we are going to close all the shutters. So we can any, any light go through uh, the micro shutter arrays, and we open the entrance of the integral field unit to get the spectra of the, uh, of the integral field unit. And it gets complicated because uh, the, uh, on the right side is the same undone uh, sketch with, uh, with uh, micro shutter quadrants. But you see now these blue small lines on the, on the left, they, act, they actually, they are where the spectra start for the, for the FU. So then on the data, you occupy all this blue space. So that you need to close the micro shutters, otherwise you get everything overlapping. The spectra are always there. And then the FU spectra on the back, on the, at the bottom also. And this uh, blue square that we could see just previously, it's the entrance of the AFU. That's why it's your three by three arc seconds uh, light entering. And then you, it's uh, sliced, really sliced on 30 slices there. So that's, uh, it's a complex field of view layout, but we had to put uh, two instruments in one, basically. So that's it for the, instrument, the generic uh, part on the instrument. Now we move to multi-object spectroscopy. So for the multi-object spectroscopy, the challenge was, of course, to be to have something allowing us to select objects. Uh, this is done with arrays of micro shutters. They have been uh, provided by uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, to give you an order of magnitude, basically, each array contains 365 by 171 shutters. So total, we have around a quarter of a million of them. And micro shutters, because they are 100 mon by 200 microns, so it's the, the thickness uh, of the air, basically. And we have this quarter of a million of shutters. And what you see on the right, it's, it's not a model. It's, uh, it's really a real near-spec exposure. Near -spec is a, as an imaging mode, which is not used for science, but for talent acquisition. And, but so what we can do is, uh, as we can command individually all, all these shutters, we can basically play and uh, make images. So that's what we did here uh, with, with the logos of the various partners, and we the shutters in order to reproduce them. And then we, we took an exposure. OK, so that's, in practice, when you observe the sky, you will open much less shutters. You will really focus on your object. But that's what you, this is something you can do. And one thing. What I wanted to in this image is that, of course, with a quarter million shutters, all, not all of them are operable. But typically, we need 85 to 90 percent of them, and this is what we have at the end of the day. But you see, if you have the JWST logo on the bottom right corner of the image, what you see is that in areas where everything should be white, so in this area, you, you expect all the shutters to be open, you can see some of them did not not open. Okay, so there are shutters that will not open, and there's a small fraction of them, so less than 15%. And then we, there are also uh, a few, in this case, I'm not talking about percent, but uh, less than 20 in the current uh, micro shutter arrays that we have in near spec, which will actually be always open. So we have non operable shutters. But so far, so good, we have enough to basically to meet what we call our multiplex requirement, or many objects we can observe at the same time. One, and I think I have two slides on that because I think it's very important, is that people using MOS on ground, quite what you, what you have is that you, you are able to place your apertures on your objects. Here we are, we are in a different scheme. We have a regular grid of apertures, and then we have the objects on the sky. And we have to find the best combination, the best match between the objects you want to observe and which shutters you, you can open you, you, and which objects basically will, uh, um, are compatible in terms of spectral overlap on the detector. So it's going to be uh, quite uh, work to prepare observations. But there is a tool in which is being developed for the preparation of the observation by STSCI. And it's um, 
uh, it's already uh, you can already play with it uh, because it's part of the observation uh, preparation uh, tools uh, for JWST already. Um, so the example which I give here has been uh, it comes from uh, um, an example prepared by CSCI where you, you see omega sense, so high density of potential targets there, and you're going to open uh, shutters located at some of the objects. And they have plotted in orange in the, on, on, right, on the right side uh, some examples of shutters that would not open. Our tool is going to take everything, all that into account to give you a best match between the sh objects and the shutters. But the warning slide, it's, um, it's also something which is different from the what's two for most observations. If your grid is fixed, once you identify the objects, at the end of the day, you cannot, you cannot open the aperture right at the position of the objects. So what you will get is a distribution of uh, centering of the objects inside the, um, inside the aperture. So for compact objects, you have some better center than the others. And it has some impact on uh, how many photons make it through the aperture, and also on the accuracy of the radiometric calibration. The other element is if you rotate your telescope, so for JWST, it means when you observe an object, you will have a, uh, a flow plus minus five degrees uh, set of orientations on the sky. So here, the list of objects you can observe may vary a little bit, so you, this will have to be taken in, into account in the puzzles. So it's work in progress because key observers will need uh, key guidelines and everything like that. So we are working on that. SCSCI is working on that, so stay tuned, and uh, progressively we will get more and more elaborated uh, guidelines and tools. And uh, I'm putting at the bottom of the slide, basically, the, uh, the link to the AP the uh, proposal preparation tool for the WST, which is uh, I, uh, joined to the HST one in uh, delivered together with the HST one. So this was and uh, an example, and this is uh, an example with uh, the old detectors before we changed them, which had a lot of odd pixels. The new ones are very clean, but uh, at exposure just at the beginning of the year, so I didn't have time to redo all the, the graphics. But what you see here in a zoom, you, what we did, we opened what we call a dash slit. We open one shutter, then you have dark region, which is a closed shutter, and we open another one, close one, open one, close one, and we do that in different places on, in, within the aspect field of view. So this is imaging mode, and then you just disperse. And then you, you get this kind of dash slits of spectra and we use the um, another spectrum, which I, I like quite a lot, which is uh, one hour calibration lamp as some absorption lines. And it looks more like a real spectrum at the end of the day. So the type of, of things, uh, and this is the result for, this is an exposure obtained during a test, a test campaign. Another element uh, for observers is basically sensitivity and uh, like all JBST instruments, the aspect is going to be extremely sensitive. And what is plotted here is sensitivity to continuum uh, spectrum at low spectral resolution. And the green curve is basically our sensitivity limit in 10 kiloseconds for a to noise of 10. And what you have with is uh, you, you, go easy, you go below the 100 nanogen skis. This is done using uh, observation scheme which includes nodding. So what you see here in green the, is a sketch showing three shutters. So what you do is you open a, a slit, a mini slit, what we call a mini slit, made of uh, three shutters, and you, you get three, ex three consecutive exposures uh, where you nod, and this uh, to allow good uh, background subtraction. And this allows me also to, to stress one thing, is that the shutters do not have feeling factor of 100%. So there are bars between shutters, they have a structure. So there will be, in fact, this, uh, this gap here, this uh, bar, will be present in real data. Okay, and it's, uh, it's typically linearly uh, along the spatial direction, not particular to the aperture. Uh, it's around 14%. So that's characteristic of uh, near spec, most mode. 
we're limiting sensitivities, lines um, in uh, at, at R equal 1000. This is an example for line and uh, using the higher resolution mode. And we have a one uh, another plot giving you typical uh, sensitivity for for spectrum resolved lines uh, um, at R equal 2700. So this okay. If you have that. I think you will have the presentation available, so this you can use that as a reference. And uh, this is a simulation here of more something where that uh, zodiacal light and some objects, some point-like galaxies. And you can see always in the middle, you have always the spectra of the slits, which all do, do always the same pattern. And then you have the, the spectra of the individual objects for which we have opened uh, uh, these mini slits of uh, one by three micro or three micro shutters. Uh, this is an example when we were uh, basically uh, uh, practicing our data processing system where we have the spectra with zodiacal light and the object in the middle. Some of them you see lines, in fact. Uh, and you extract the spectra for each shutter. At this, this stage, there is still some distortion, the spectra curve, and then rectify them. And uh, this is, we were basically applying our standard uh, uh, near spec pipeline uh, to that. To use a little bit more of the sensitivity, uh, this is an example uh, from uh, some galaxy from 2006 uh, observed in, photo in with photometry, and you have a best fit uh, spectral energy distribution, and you can see basically in green the sensitivity limit of uh, near spec uh, in 10 kiloseconds. So you can get the spectrum. Uh, it was quite uh, nice. A recent one, I took, uh, I put side by side the the plot on the paper of uh, et al on the Z equal 11 uh, galaxy. And you see the levels, they are typically at the 200 nanogensky uh, uh, level. So it should be uh, well detected and uh, at um, uh, in 10 kiloseconds. And you have to imagine that here, if we are using the prism, we don't get only the 1 to 1.6 micron round. We, we also go to up to 5 micron. It's a set of examples uh, from members of the Nearspec Science team uh, playing with spectra, uh, this uh, these are model spectra at Z equal 4.5 and different uh, magnitude, and look at what you get uh, um, this time in 20 kiloseconds. So very sensitive instrument, uh, like, uh, as I say, like every JWST instrument. We have a few, also the integral field unit, so this is the hardware. Uh, looks big li like that, but in fact it's uh, it's a shoebox. And uh, what you see on the bottom uh, left is the slicer, uh, which is going to slice the, the image in 30 uh, pieces. The characteristics, as I said before, 30 slices, small field of view, 3 by 3 half seconds, good sampling, 0.1 by 0.1 half second. And uh, you can use it uh, at low, medium, and high spectral resolution. So an example and, uh, of uh, ISU data, uh, review data of uh, more than one year ago now, and still using this uh, famous uh, uh, filter lamp with a filter with absorption lines. And you can see at the bottom left uh, the, the spectrum and, uh, with the ISU. So uh, as, uh, these are the two detectors. And then you see uh, the, the AFU spectra, the 30 slices making 30 sets of spectra. And the same thing here, right is the raw exposure. Then on the top, uh, or top no, sorry, left, and then the top right, you have the spectra before rectification. Uh, there's some distortion, they are curved. And after rectification, when we process. And uh, in the middle, at the bottom, uh, you actually get a reconstructed image. Uh, it's an AFU. So, and uh, you can do the same thing at higher spectral resolution. And I, I use that also just to highlight uh, there is a gap between the two detectors. So this uh, tilted stripe here, it, it's a gap in wavelength coverage. Uh, when you have high spectral resolution spectra, you cross the gap between the detectors, so there will be some wavelength missing, a small amount, but there will be some. And the wrong structure here, uh, which is uh, on one of the detectors, is not present anymore because we changed the detectors, and it was actually a defect in, in the detector. And it would show up in the spectra, of course, because there was no, no data there. 
One example of simulation also, what I did a few years ago was to take, uh, in fact, uh, VLT, VMOS, uh, IFU spectra from Beloki et al. Uh, it was a galaxy observed in nitrogen 2H alpha, and I took the cubes, and I basically, these are the images from the paper, and I took the cube, took uh, the lines, and made a cube that I, that I entered in the simulator of near spec, uh, and I scaled the image to either to fill the VFU field of view, or to have a one by one half second uh, uh, version. I do it, it was a model and just a toy model. So you have a cube, the reconstructed cube after simulation uh, for the large version on the left and for the compact version on the right. And when you, you plot spectra, uh, you, you actually see the, uh, I had injected the, re, the, re, the real spectra from uh, the VMOS observation, which, uh, which included some, uh, some velocity uh, changes across the field of view, and you find them again uh, in, the, in the simulated data. So that's one example of uh, IFU uh, modeled. It's simulated the IFU observations. And in different category, just to give you another example, not a galaxy this time, uh, we also took a look at uh, one nice thing about the IFU is that uh, for targets where the position is not known very accurately, and typically uh, one good one set of targets, good candidates for that, or uh, solar system uh, targets, moving targets, and we, we were taking a look at what could we do uh, using a trans objects, so TNOs, uh, with JWST. And in this case, it's, it's a point-and-shoot approach where you don't really try to acquire the target. You know the scope is pointing accurately. You know that within the three accident field of view of near, or a few of near spec, you will always end up having your point source uh, in there. So you go point-and-shoot. And uh, um, you cover some uh, part of the neon thread uh, um, spectrum. And in this case, we took uh, a medium size uh, TNO, so Orcus like, a uh, little bit below uh, 1,000 kilometers in, in, in diameter. And we were looking at can we distinguish between different uh, models for the ice composition, the surface ice composition. And very clearly, you can do it. And we are talking here about. Um, this we go and we observe three times 1,000 seconds. So it's an hour of observations. So that's why it's also a simulation, but gives you an idea of capabilities of near spec. So we get to the last part um, of, uh, of the talk, this time on the slits. And uh, the, the standard slits, I'm not going to talk a lot about, about them. We have, in fact, uh, three slits of 200 milliard seconds, so same width than the micro shutters. We have a broader slit, one, which is uh, 0.4 arc second. And I'm going to, to focus after that on the 1.6 by 1.6 arc second aperture. And you have to realize this aperture was not there at the beginning of near spec. Uh, it was actually a 0.1 arc second slit, a wide slit. But then we realized that near spec could be a very good tool uh, also for transit, uh, observation of transit, uh, transiting planets. We need a wide aperture in order to get the photometric stability. Uh, so we actually modified the instrument to do that. And uh, um, so near spec is optimized for faint uh, spectroscopy. But then we basically made changes. We made some optimizations. And it should be a good instrument also for bright, bright object time series, and in particular, the planet transit spectroscopy. Um, well, ironically, it's a 6.5 meter, so one of the main worry of this mod when we were discussing initially was the saturation limit, okay? Um, but um, it's not that bad. And uh, here it's from, a, in fact, the details are in a SPAE paper. Uh, this, this is a collection of, uh, of confirmed uh, transiting uh, exoplanet, uh, exoplanet in a uh, these are the um, gray, dark gray uh, lozenges, los um, little, uh, um, which uh, um, is seeing me. Uh, but the, 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 pl the um, symbols correspond to, to planets, and um, the lines correspond to our saturation limits with near spec. And you can see we can do quite uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, the planets uh, there. This is another way of showing it. This is this time what we were trying to do is to 
figure out, okay, if everything was fine, everything was uh, perfect, the limit when you observe would be the, what we call the noise floor, will be shot noise from the star plus the detector noise. So we made computations uh, looking at uh, what can we achieve as a function of the star mag magnitude. So what you see is wavelength, uh, the x-axis, see the star magnitude in the j-band as the y-axis, and the signal to noise you, you get when you, you do, in fact, uh, one hour of transit, one hour in transit, one hour off transit, okay? So what we the white region is that we, is the region where we saturate. And uh, so uh, you, this is consistent with the previous uh, slide. But then after that, you can see uh, um, kind of uh, transition between blue and green, that's why you're, you're typically at 100 ppm, and it's only one transit one hour, okay? And uh, so it's, it's actually quite, uh, quite powerful. And this is for, for M star. This was vector resolution, and if you move to high spectral res resolution, here, in fact, your saturation limit is much higher, so you can observe much brighter objects. And the fact that the spectral resolution in this configuration is much more uniform across uh, the wavelength range, uh, that also you get uh, much more uh, much more balanced results in terms of uh, signal to noise ratio. But as you can see from the x-axis, in this I'm only looking at one configuration. So we are looking at transit. We are not going to change the configuration of the instrument during one transit because we want stability. So we, in this case. Is in one transit, you do only one configuration, but you, are, you do one hour, one hour, one hour in this simulation. So, so and I think the, um, the main conclusion for this mod is that basically we, you, it's not difficult to reach noise floor levels corresponding already to 100 ppm for one, under, one hour transit duration. So we are expecting to observations uh, to, to routinely reach down to a few tens of pm. Um, Wavelength coverage uh, when you study uh, atmospheric properties of uh, exoplanet, and also you can select your spectral resolution. And of course, I was talking about noise floor, uh, so kind of an ideal uh, case. And the key at the end of the day will be to control the systematics. And uh, this, we can get nitty checks on the ground, but we will have to wait to be in orbit in order to to get uh, really real numbers. What we have from HST, Spitzer is actually giving us, us confidence that uh, we, should, we should do well because same thing, these were not observatories uh, optimized for this type of observation and, and still uh, they, did, they did very good job. So I'm going to, to end my presentation and uh, um, so I think I'm convinced about it but I'm very bad. Uh, you have you have uh, available a very versatile uh, infrared spectrograph with very good combination of sensitivity and spatial resolution. And uh, so in the coming year, we still have uh, work on the hardware integration and all these things, but a lot of work on the tools that will be provided to the observers uh, uh, for the ob preparing the observation, executing them, and uh, archiving them. But, uh, all the presentation. Wide, so you really have to go for a point source. Otherwise, you going to merge to overlap a lot, and you won't be able to use the um, correctly. Try the question correctly. So, so you assume that. 
that there's going to be a point source and that's what you target? Yes, uh, for the aperture, yes. And it's really not done for imaging exoplanets. It's really to look at transiting ones. I'm not imaging the planet. I'm just asking how, whether you, you sum up all the light within that aperture or whether you're oh. targeting a single point source sitting somewhere within that aperture. Okay, the plan is initially to sum up everything. And uh, probably once we know better the instruments, we will have uh, summation schemes which are smarter and make use of the fact that it's a point source. Okay. So what are the plans for a NERSPEC uh, team, CTO team? How, what is the rough plan of how they're going to use their time, what type of time? Do you guys know already? Or? You have a broad, um, broad distribution. The central part of the GTO program for near spec is going to be uh, Galaxy Assembly and uh, MOS and uh, IFU. And there's small programs covering uh, things like uh, star formation, um, the planets, and uh, also uh, solar system objects. But, uh, you find, in fact, the Galaxy Assembly program to the JWST 2015 conference website. There were presentations giving a broad outline of this program already in October last year. Okay, thank you. The, the Galaxy Evolution part of the program, you, you said you're mostly using ICU, is that what you said? Not and I have a multi object spectroscopy and I feel. Okay. And uh, I think it's a presentation from uh, Marine Frank and Andy Bunker uh, at, uh, at the conference. With the uh, with micro shares that you showed, um, you already have a few that, that are not uh, working the way you do. Are expected decay in the micro shutters over the mission lifetime? So the answer is yes and no, <laughs> because we, we don't have uh, enough uh, experience in time to be to be sure uh, or evolve. But already, that uh, in terms of uh, failed open, there's a very slow increase. And we have to do a kind of an annealing to try to get rid of the new ones. The closed, uh, more of the shutters which are fake closed, it's more than uh, infant uh, mortality. So once we are in orbit, we don't expect them to change a lot. Okay, interesting. Other questions online, Christine? Okay, so we have a any, okay. uh, does anybody want to pipe up with any questions online? You, if you're trying, it would be good to, okay, I see Crystal, and so I'm going to unmute. Uh, please, Beth. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, can you go through the presentation, like a coin of it, putting it in the center of the ASU, like the like object? It doesn't at this stage to really use the ASU for acquisition. Uh, the plan is to use, in fact, if we try to acquire for an aperture, to use the uh, 1.6 second square aperture for that. Because if you use the ASU, it means that on board, so really autonomously, you would have reconstructed the image from the 30 slices and everything. It's much more complicated than using the aperture. Are there any questions online? Um, I don't see any at this time. Um, so why don't we go ahead and thank Pierre? Yes, thank you very so much, Pierre. And of course, uh, Pierre's uh, presentation, um, the one that you just watched now, along with his slides and abstract, will be available on the website.
website. Um, thank you very much. And I guess in one month's time, we'll have a talk by Renee Doyon on Nearest.